Hello and welcome to another episode of It Came From The Page. And today, we're doing something a little bit differently, uh, mainly because I tried to do a video yesterday, and I recorded it like three times. It didn't really turn out how I wanted it to turn out, so I was looking for something else, and any excuse, literally any excuse, to do something different today <laughs> for this week. And uh, luckily for me, Juan, over at Plagued by Visions, uh, created his own book tag. And I thought, hey, never actually done a book tag before. It would be fun to kind of participate in a book tag. And it's called The Faces of Horror. And this is a really interesting book tag because I think it really kind of creates a very interesting uh, array of things to discuss uh, because of the entire impotence of doing this video and the way that he kind of formulated this book tag is basically talking about how for a lot of reasons even still even today horror is still kind of looked down as a genre sometimes not even giving its own credence as a genre in like bookstores and it's very strange to me because it's always been something that's always made money especially if you look at the film world right in in film horror has always made money but it's still looked down upon as like a lowbrow genre so this is a, an interesting uh, tag in that it kind of is prompting us to talk about different emotions we felt while watching things that were supposedly gutter trash, essentially. <laughs> and I, was, you know, was really interested in, in kind of doing this. So the very first prompt um, is a horror story that scared or disturbed you. Now, I, I kind of set a challenge for myself. So there's two books for for most of my choices here and one is um if you follow this channel to to any extent you will know um if horror is gutter trash media tie-in horror is super gutter trash nobody cares about that i'm talking novelization i'm talking books written in a fictional universe um that if it was film people would care but as soon as it's a book form people just stop caring or, or treat it like trash so part of this is to uh talk about some media tie-in books that kind of match all of these to kind of defend those but also talk about you know normal books as well <laughs> so yeah so the very first prompt which is a horror story that either scared or disturbed you um i broke this down into both uh, of these categories so scared uh, I chose a media tie-in book, uh, Alien Prototype by Tim Wagner. Now, this is scary in that it really deals with uh, a virus. <laughs> so the, the central story of this is the xenomorph that we all know and love from the Alien franchise gets infected with necrosis. So it has a, <laughs> a virus in there. So it's given to a host who has necrosis. And as such, uh, anytime it touches anyone or anytime anyone gets near this creature, you get it and your skin and your body just starts to dissolve. And it makes it so that it really is kind of an, a, a viral outbreak because wherever the creature goes, it leaves little pockets and it gets in the air ducts, and it kills all of these people in the most grotesque ways, and the alien even itself is kind of extra creepy because it's got, like, these buboes on it full of, like, necrosis, and it is completely terrifying. Um, and uh, Wagner does a great job in describing what it's like to see your body dissolve in front of you, and that's just scary, especially, you know, going through COVID times, right? Anything that has that, that extra level of virus element to it is, is something that actually scares me something that disturbed me and definitely made me lose some sleep uh i'm gonna go with a jack ketchum book uh not not too big of a surprise here he is kind of one of the the masters of uh, of this particular <laughs> genre <laughs> of disturbing horror stories and um i'm gonna go with the girl next door this book is really hard to get through but i think it was a really important book to get through if you are at all, you know, if any of your triggers or anything uh, sets you off in regards to, like, sexual violence, you should definitely avoid this book. Um, this book is all about a really, really disturbing case that stuck with Ketchum. So he had to write a book from the perspective of 
this young girl who pretty much got lost, locked in a basement and tortured. And he creates this really horrifying tale about childhood. And it is something that's really hard to read. It's tough. It disturbs you. But it's one of those things where you kind of have to go into it, right? These are topics that they happen in real life. So if they happen in real life, you kind of have to go into it and talk about it. Um, and if you don't, uh, nothing will change. Nothing can get better unless you address these horrific issues that infect society. Um, and uh, this one tackles it. It tackles it. And it's a hard read and it's a disturbing read. And uh, I would say I lost some sleep over this. Like it's... Whew, this this one affected me quite a bit, uh, but it's one of those things where I think it's important. I think it's really, really important that you read a book like this, if you're a man, especially. Um, it, if you're a woman, you, you probably know pretty much all the stuff that this book is going to go for, but, but most men should read this book and kind of understand uh, the horrible society, <laughs> how horrible society can be. Um, so yeah, that's a, definitely a disturbing book. Um, the next one is horror, a horror story that depressed you or made you cry. So this is interesting. So I went with something a little bit off the off the beaten path for this one, at least for um, my first first pick here. My first pick is actually an audio drama, and it is uh, called "We're Alive: A Story of Survival." And this is a multi-season post-apocalypse zombie tale, um, essentially. And um, it really made me sad. Like, it made me sad. <laughs> really, really, really kind of, like, affected me in that it's something that went on for so long. And as far as audio dramas go, I don't think I've ever heard a better audio drama than We're Alive. Um, it, I found it really moving. I, It's one of those things where I was, like, marathoning it. So I went through all four seasons really quickly. And it's one of those things where you get so invested in this world and get so invested in these characters that the depressing part is the, oh, it's over, right? So it's the idea of eventually you spend all this time in a series and then it's over. And then you're just kind of sitting there like, what's next? Like, what, is this it? Like, is this the ending for everything? And you just kind of like, you stop and you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to pick up another book right now to get into that or if I just want to sit in this, feeling of fin finality and i find like the feeling of finality can really be kind of depressing or sad and i think what's what's also really important about a story like we're alive is that it is a story that has really good characters and to get any emotional movements from horror you need to have really good characters and not all the characters uh make it out of uh, of the scenario and of this situation and i just found the entire experience really moving and i really found all the characters really well established and especially like you know we're talking about an audio drama like it's insane like this is an audio drama um this is not um something that people would maybe check out so if you haven't heard we're alive i would definitely suggest you start at the beginning obviously it's a it's a continuous story uh, and give it a few episodes to see what you think of and see if you like it i mean as far as like you know as far as the zombie, a lot of people feel like the zombie outbreaks, zombie storylines are played out. And I and I tend to agree, to be honest. Uh, we have seen pretty much everything under the sun in terms of zombie media. But this one is great, and I think that it's better than 90% of all zombie media. I think that this, this story in this series does tackle a lot of similar things to something like say the walking dead but i think it does it way better than the walking dead and i'm talking both comic and show and i think it it nails that sense of post apocalyptic zombie fiction and it does it in such a unique and interesting ways that i thought that it was bar none the best zombie fiction ever in my opinion um as terms especially in terms of long term like if you're just talking about episodics and we'll, we'll have a discussion there but just a long term storytelling thing and that always makes you sad when you're done, when you're done with a world, when a world is finished. I always find that like really sad. Um, and the other one, more conventional pick, uh, but not really, but this is My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. I read this last year and oh my goodness, 
there i don't want to ruin this this one's relatively new i would definitely recommend it i read it in sorry i listened to it in audiobook format and i know that a lot of people are kind of uh i've seen in a lot of facebook groups and stuff that people talk about how they have difficulty getting into this story and i do wonder if stephen graham jones is one of those authors that really really works well and works best in terms of audiobooks uh, because when I was listening to this and I got really into this, I got really into the the way that Graham Jones writes and can kind of get into his voice a little bit easier from the audiobook format. Um, but if you don't know what this is, so this is a slasher film. Uh, sorry, this is a slasher book, but it is kind of like a, a modern slasher book. And it's really fascinating. It's got a lot of unique elements to it. There are some reveals in this story that I found extremely heartbreaking, extremely depressing, and extremely moving. Um, and it is kind of, it does touch on some of the similar themes to something like The Girl Next Door by Jack Kectrum, but it does it where this is not like an outside view of this story. This is um, a story from the perspective of our main character and once you kind of understand what our main character has gone through and why she is the way she is you'll understand the entire book better it's one of those things where once you get a full grasp of the character everything makes sense every decision that you might have been like huh what what what's going on and and the reveal of what happened to her broke my heart in a very intense way um and you know there's definitely i definitely cried at that one so my heart is a chainsaw is definitely a very sad book that made me cry uh number three a horror story that made you laugh so i have two for one of these i'm gonna do a reading i have before me swarm by arthur herzog this is for the most part a pretty intense pretty campy uh book about killer bees that show up and a lot of it is math there's a lot of math and science and like oh what are these bees who are they killing why are they killing blah 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 and it's kind of like uh you know a really fun really creative uh animal attack book right now i'm gonna read you a clip um from a, a character's speech so essentially, this is a sequence that is from the perspective of a political party that's trying to take advantage of the killer bees and trying to be like, oh, no, we should be nice to bees. Everything will be good. And um, I'm just going to read it from here. <clears throat> what do we want? Perry Goodall shouted into the mic. The answer came. Save the bees. What's good? Saving bees what's bad killing bees bees give us what honey and flowers what do we like honey and flowers what do we need bees <laughs> and obviously that's kind of written in a way to kind of make fun of politicians um and and how they grasp onto to to ideas and to events and kind of twist them for their own needs to get ahead uh basically it's that exchange is funnier to me than the entirety of that terrible netflix movie don't look up everything that that movie don't look up is trying to say was said in the swarm within those three to four lines and i find that line hilarious i love that i love that scene in the swarm i think it's great satire and it's really funny and it doesn't break the world and it's just it's very silly and now the other way so the other way that horror can make me laugh i am one of those people who will stress laugh occasionally like i will laugh and be like i can't believe they did that um and it can sometimes make me look like a monster especially if i'm in a movie theater uh case in point there's a scene in the movie hereditary where something very shocking happens to a character and a telephone pole if you've seen it you know if you haven't you'll know when you watch this and uh i was in the theater and i believe i laughed at this because i was like oh my god i can't believe they did that and i laughed um it is not a funny scene it is a horrifying scene uh and it was basically like i was laughing to cut the tension with myself but everyone else in the theater must have thought i was a monster um, so I thought there's the two ways of uh, 
things in horror that can make you laugh. It can be something where you laugh just out of stress to break the tension for yourself. Or you could, <laughs> you could laugh at a hilarious moment in a book. A horror story that made you angry. So I have two. Two in here. And one is good. Good anger. And one is bad anger. And the two differences are... What I think is good anger is about a villain, right? If you're mad about a villain, if you're mad about a person who's bad, and you'd be like, oh, I just hate this character, and I, there's the ways that you're in, this, in the mind of this horrible person, and it's supposed to make you mad. It's, it's something that's effectively making you mad and making you mad for a purpose, right? And for that, I, another Alien book. I chose Alien the Cold Forge by Alex White, and uh, Alex White is a wonderful author, and they create an amazing villain in this character called Dorian Sudler. And you are inside of this character's brain, and he is the essential company man. So if you, whatever you think of when you hear the word company man, that's who Dor Dorian Sudler starts out as. And then he just completely goes into an insane psychopath as the book goes on. And the reason why it really makes you angry is because, one, he's the antagonist of this book um, in, in, in many ways, scarier than the aliens. Um, and he is really screwing over one of our main characters, who is Blue Marshallis, who is a disabled character. And she's just trying to survive. And she's got a very complicated story, but Dorian constantly kind of taunts her and like does all these really messed up things to her. Um, and really kind of constantly talks down to her whenever they have interactions because he is aware of his own power uh, over her at all times because he is able-bodied pretty much. And Dorian is such an, a crazy villain and you, you spend so much time with him and you spend time in his perspective, which I think is very fascinating, and you just get angry. He does terrible things in this book and you get to experience the world through the eyes of this psychopath and it's really fascinating it's done really well at the tension is 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 really good um and it, it was really kind of interesting to make him one of two characters you pretty much spend the most time with because you get blue marsalis which is kind of the protagonist she does some messed up things in the book too but in order to survive um and dorian Sudler, who is this antagonist and you those are the two characters who you really embody and you spend the most time with and you spend the most time in their heads in their in their mo missions to survive and whew, it's good anger because you don't want to like this guy and it feels really true to life um, how the world <laughs> treats disabled people um, and it's the, the the kind of anger that's like get out and vote these people in screw the mega corporations like fun fun anger uh, in that it's productive it's a productive anger the other anger which doesn't give me any it has no productivity and just boils my my bones and makes me like infuriated whenever i think about this is a comic book series um i don't know if this is breaking the rules but we're gonna do it we're gonna talk about comic books and we're gonna talk about freddy versus jason versus ash the nightmare warriors now if you're not a, a super ooper duper nerd you probably don't even know what i'm talking about so freddy versus jason which is freddy krueger the slasher villain versus jason Voorhees, the other slasher villain they had a movie and when they had their movie, it kind of had a, a, a definitive ending where one character looked like they won that movie. Um, and they made a sequel comic book series where they brought in Ash Williams from the Evil Dead. And that was Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash, that first little that story. Now, there are issues with that first story, but as far as that goes, as far as that is, it's kind of like a fun little uh mix up between these three characters and kind of introduces them and kind of addresses what makes them different what makes them unique why do we like these characters and it does kind of give something to most of them all, most if not all three of those characters really do get a a good and interesting uh scenarios for them to kind of battle it out in and it's very fun it's nothing it's nothing mind blowing um, it has a lot of the same problems that the movie Freddy vs. Jason has. But, you know, if you just want to see three very beloved characters duke it out, you could do a lot worse.
And believe me, they did. Because they made a sequel series because that first series sold pretty good. And this is The Nightmare Warriors. A... 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 <sighs> A series that decides to bring back all of the surviving characters from the Friday the 13th movies, the Jason side, and the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the Freddy Krueger side. And it brings all these characters back in order to team up with Ash to finally take down these two maniacs who once again come back. Freddy Krueger takes over the White House, becomes super godlike powers. He asks Jason what he wants, and Jason's like, because he doesn't speak. And he goes, oh, I know what you want, Jason, to be hot. And I'm like, what? So he, like, Freddy Krueger does some moody, 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 moody magic, and all of a sudden, like, a ripped Jason Voorhees with these flowing locks shows up. And I'm like, um, what are we doing here? And he's like, yes, Jason, you will now be my emissary. You will be the general as I use all of hell and destroy the world and i'm like what about the freddy versus jason part oh they're teamed up now okay i guess and then we get to be introduced to all of the returning characters if you like any of these characters from these perspective films you will not like this book because it does not want to address or reassess these characters as they existed they just want to turn them into things to be murdered it, it it they they kind of destroy all of these character arcs that happened in these individual movies to bring them back for a story that has no heart no interesting elements is just a dumpster fire isn't even fun is bad it's trash it makes me very very angry and we will never talk about it again just kidding i'm sure i will talk about this at some other point and do like a full breakdown uh, but if you ever see this in the wild burn the comics that's my goal i'm not in favor of burning books this is not in favor. just burn the comics burn them and remove them from existence you'll be happier not to ban them just get rid of them get rid of them we never need to see them again um i take away all all the power i've ever given you freddy versus jason versus ash the nightmare warriors <laughs> <sighs> talking about things that are not anger inducing <laughs> now let's go to point five which is a horror story that is important to you this is interesting this is an, a, an interesting prompt um because uh there are a lot there's a lot of horror stories that do have a deep significance to me but i decided to go one movie and then one book um so for movie i wanted to kind of again because one of the themes is that i am going into the depths of things that people don't even like if they like horror we're going to talk about halloween the curse of michael myers from 1995 yes this is halloween 6 this is the one with our dear friend and savior uh paul rudd we're on a first name basis me and paul we're super tight i wish but uh young baby paul rudd is in this and of course we got donald pleasance returning as uh, Dr. Loomis. And the, the reason why this movie that admittedly mm, is not great. There's a lot of issues with there. You know, this is the whole thing where it introduces a evil cult from Michael Myers. Um, if you don't know the Halloween movies, the first Halloween movie is just a guy in a plain white mask stalking babysitters. And then in the second movie, they go, oh, he was stalking you because... Yeah, well, related. And then if you've watched any of the newer movies from 2018, uh, they go, oh, we don't talk about the time when they were related. Now we're just going to go off of it was a random attack kind of thing. But this was back in um, the, the 90s where there was still kind of a continuity. And that continuity was like he goes after Michael Meyer kind of just goes after his family. And um, there's some messed up stuff that happens in this this movie. Um, there's also two cuts of this movie. There's a producer's cut and there's a theatrical cut. The theatrical cut has much better kills. The producer's cut has a, a story that kind of makes sense. Um, and I am talking a lot of, and a lot of it sounds negative. So you might be like, why is this important to me? Well, for one, for one reason only, uh, Donald Pleasance, this is Donald Pleasance's very last film role. And they make it so that at one point, Dr. Loomis has had a stroke. Uh, and he's recovered from the stroke and like is, is still kind of living but he has like a cane and he you know he, he has like you can tell part of his like 
half of his side is weak. He's still got a little bit of burns from Halloween 2 where he should have died, but they brought him back, so uh, don't worry about it. But he's got, like, half of his body is kind of, like, weak in that, that area already. Um, and believe it or not, I've watched a lot of movies recently, and a lot of movies that specifically involve characters recovering from strokes because I had a pretty serious stroke. And a lot of times it's either something that happens, by the way, this happens, um, like where they, they have complete paralysis um, or there's like um, a very easily visible disability. Um, but a lot of times it can you can kind of recover it from it, but not fully. Um, and I have a like I walk with a cane now. I have like my my knee buckles. I can't lift more than 10, 10 pounds with this. Uh, this arm constantly kind of turns complete purple if I use it too much. Um, and I just felt that this movie has a very respectable and respectful treatment of Sam Loomis suffering from a stroke. And just his him living on afterwards. And I'm just, it's not over the top. It's not, uh, and again, when I'm talking about over the top, um, there are certain movies that, that don't do it realistically. But there are like... There are stages, um, and there can be like complete visible paralysis. But if you haven't had a stroke, most time the actors try to do it. They they overact it to the extreme. Um, that's just kind of one of the factors of life. <laughs> but uh, it's it's done really really kind of subtly, and I think it really works. And I think it kind of makes this very silly movie rather important. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe that uh, it's one of the ones that, in my opinion, from my own experience, obviously, if you've had a stroke and you feel differently, more power to you. This is only from my lived-in experience. This is why it's things that are important to me. <laughs> I enjoy uh, the way that he portrays that, and I think it's the best that I've come across. Weird. Very weird. Very weird. And the second one, um, it does tie in a lot to the importance from the, that Sam Loomis having a stroke in <laughs> in Curse of Michael Myers. But my second one, and I'm a bit, bit cliche, but this is It for, by Stephen King. And the main reason I pick this is because the movie and the, well, sorry, the is because the book is almost in a complete air of anti-nostalgia. This is not a book that wants to revisit the past and go, wow, everything was better than we should just go back to live in the past and just enjoy the past. And it's a book that acknowledges that while you were young, when you were having these formative experiences, a lot of terrible things were happening. The terrible things in the world were always happening. There was no brighter, better, golden era, right? There was a time when you felt a specific way and when you had this, this idea of feeling safe. But the idea and what you had is not universal, was never universal. There's always horrible things happening around you. And I think as a culture right now, we are really obsessed with looking back to the past and being like, wow, things were great then. Let's ignore all the things that came after it. Legacy sequels, for example. I don't like the new Halloween because it just dumps out everything and goes, let's go back to the old one when it was great and let's make it great again. That phrase has a very horrifying political meaning now because of conservative parties. And it's this idea that this thing that existed then was the greatness, was the greatness. And there was a great time in the world. And the reality is, if you've studied history at all, uh, and you look outside yourself and outside the experiences that you had during that time period, uh, there was bad stuff happening always. So I find that nostalgia is not something to avoid um it's something that you can address and you can enjoy something and you can go oh I, I i like this as a kid i enjoy it now but you can't live there and i feel like you know from after i had the stroke i can't live in the past because there's so much i can't do now i used to be a long distance runner i can't do that now but i can't live my entire life thinking about what i lost i have to keep moving forward and i think that's one of the things about it by Stephen King, where it's really kind of addressing and looking into that the the moments and the differences between being a child and being an adult, and finding out that as an adult you can still achieve great things, you can still make important relationships, you can still do the things that you thought you only could do 
when you were a kid. It might be harder. It might be very difficult, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. And I think that I found that a really important idea to my current existence, to how I'm going to continue going on forward. And it's not that the things that happened in the past were not important and were not impactful and didn't mean something. Those connections still matter. They still mean something. But you need to ensure that you don't live in the past. You can learn from the past. You can enjoy stuff from the past. But you can't live in the past. The past is a foreign language, is a foreign country that you, you can never be into. The further you go back, the more it's not even like another country. It's like an entirely different universe. You can't live in the past. The past is no longer exists. It happened. It's gone. You can't get back there. And that is one of the things about it is it's really is kind of like talking about how the impacts and things that happened when you were young were great and that's cool and that's good. We can appreciate that, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy being an adult. And I think that's one of those things that uh, is important to me right now. So I hope that I hope I worded, worded that well. If not, I don't know. <laughs> Number six, and the final part of this prompt, a non-horror story that you consider horror. Kind of goes into things that are important to me, by the way. Uh, this is going to be a little bit off the beaten path because I know Juan, when he did his, he talked about a piece of fiction and talked about how it was the fiction, uh, like a, a piece of like literary fiction that he found that he felt was had a lot of horrific elements to it. And, and use that idea. Um, for me, I'm not going with fiction at all. I'm going with nonfiction. And I think that one of the most powerful tools and one of the most horrific tools is to study history. Future Andrew here. Uh, in the process of editing this video, I'm missing the last uh, finish to the prompt. Uh, essentially, I just argued that history books are where you find the uh, truest horror. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I recorded it. I had it. And then the last two to three minutes just disappeared. Uh, I'm not really sure why. Uh, I talk about burying my heart at Wounded Knee and other kind of talking about history and talking about the farther you go back into uh, history, the more instances you find of just horrific statistics where you can't live in that period you don't know what that person was feeling like you don't know what they liked what they disliked anything about them all you have is a statistic at the end of the day um and hearing a <laughs> like a history professor just dryly present horrific murders to you in the thousands um, and having no emotion behind it and just it being a statistic is more horrifying than, than anything else because we have this veneer of fiction. Um, but this has no, uh, none of the nuance of, you know, writing a story. Um, anyways, that was what I did say, and I did say it better than that, I bet. But, uh, oh well. Sorry about that, guys. Here's some kitties. Hello, miss. Want to say goodbye to the people? He does not. He does not want to say goodbye to the people. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in doing this tag at all, do it. Um, I was going to tag people like Pax, but uh, Pax was already tagged by Juan, so I don't have anyone to tag. So uh, stay, stay cool, pony boy.